Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Rob McKenna, and I'm an advisor with the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. Um, it's HRSA's honor to support the Telehealth Resource Centers, and it's my honor to welcome you to this session, uh, Building Resiliency Through Building a Telehealth Program. Uh, I'm excited that you're here. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you for your interest in the topic. Um, know that like with all of the breakouts so far in the conference, we'll be using the conference app uh, to uh, receive and respond to questions. So please go ahead and to begin submitting yours uh, or upvote others that you see if you share them. Um, alternatively, uh, you're also welcome to raise your hand, your virtual hand here uh, in the Zoom room and we'll unmute you so that you can be heard in making your question or comment. Um, and in this session, you can do that throughout the presentation. Uh, our speaker is uh, pretty interactive. She enjoys that. Uh, and so we're not necessarily going to wait until the end. We'll address yours as, as we can. Um, I do hope that you're loving the conference as much as I am so far. Uh, and if so, I know you'll enjoy this session uh, and its speaker, Sarah Kessler a senior telehealth program strategist at the University of Vermont Health Network. Uh, it's clear from her bio, which remember you have access to if you want to read that in the app, uh, that she has a lot of experience from which we're about to learn. Uh, and so without further ado, let's start doing that. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for uh, being here and sharing with us today. Thank you, Rob. So let's see. I'm going to start off with some objectives. Today we're going to go through from a resiliency perspective. We'll go through some of the barriers that we faced as a telehealth team um, prior to COVID and kind of a response we've been referring um, to it. Um, how we broke those barriers and other barriers in response and then what we're going to plan for our future. Some background on the University of Vermont Health Network. We um, are comprised of six hospitals um, within Vermont and New York. We also have a home health and hospice system which physically sits in Vermont um, in Colchester and in County. We serve about one million patients. Um, this is a map that shows us um, geographic and it also has some um, is on there which reflect kind of what services we are offering our different partners. It'd be a little outdated, but it's a little perspective on what we've been doing. Hey Sarah, hey, can, Sarah you, can you hang on for just a second because there's a little bit of feedback on your mic and I want to make sure that people are hearing you properly. Okay. That's better. Okay. I won't move. Okay. So before March of this year, uh, like everyone else had, a, had to respond. But um, prior to March, we had about 30 videos of programs through our network. So through our six squads and five partners, we had some primary care services on neurology had a fairly high volume. The country, obviously, ongoing services programs and then normal patient monitoring with, with to home health and hospice, um, and we have some video integration in those. I'm considering that the program. Um, in, in February, we were doing an average of 25 ish video visits um, each day, and we had about 150 Zoom users. Barriers we faced at that point um, are listed here. So last fall, to understand why our volume wasn't so high and why we weren't reaching the patients that we thought we partnered with our innovation lab, um, which is part of the University of Vermont, so we sit in Vermont, and we partnered with them. They're a team that works on um, asking questions from a human-centered design perspective, and they helped us interview, do some brainstorming to identify barriers. We realized that we really had to sell to health, um, not everybody even provided understanding the why behind the programs. There was a lack of interest at different levels, uh, no care 
guidelines were established. That's um, really confusing and a little uncomfortable for our staff. Um, if if it were to be offered and that ceiling would fall to the provider versus the team being aware and mindful of it, the scheduling process was a little clunky, less than ideal. Um, and again, patients weren't necessarily more asking for this and necessarily comfortable. And we have some broad and safety uh, limitations throughout the state. So that was an issue as well. Sarah, I have a quick question for you. This is Jason from the AV company. Is it possible for you to um, disconnect your audio and maybe reconnect your audio? Because I think it's still being a little bit choppy for everyone. You want me to disconnect? All right, hold on. Is that any better? Right now you sound good. Okay. I'm not, okay. Uh, let me go to the next slide, and if it's still not working, then I can move. Okay, perfect. Okay. So things we learned um, from the provider perspective during those sessions were that they they felt that it was an easy process, but they just didn't they weren't mindful of it. They weren't keeping it in mind or considering it. Um, they said that it worked well for mood and medication follow ups, but they just weren't sure about other indications. They like the convenience for patients. Um, they have some technical issues really on the patient side. And they felt like they didn't have the type of support that um, they needed. And um, they weren't really sure how it integrated into their practice as it was at that point. Feedback from staff that we were working with in technology, uh, they weren't. They weren't sure how to incorporate that process into their work. Um, there were questionnaires, there were interactive materials that they engaged with the patients on and they just felt like they weren't sure to fit that in. Um, and then the second is for kind of the appropriateness uh, and guidelines, they just weren't sure that they had the materials that they could make those decisions that was appropriate. Um, and they, they got feedback the patients to be seen in person if they weren't offering much. Um, the patient perspective on whether it was an option they were seen in person, they just didn't have internet access or the technology to support that. We did get some feedback, patients did take and liked it. They liked to have to drive, thought it worked really well for them, I didn't need to touch. At all, and some comment that the bit may feel supported anywhere because you should connect with the provider at any point in time. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Yeah, still having an issue. Yeah, okay, we are having audio issues still. Okay. It was good all briefly, right. and then it uh, stopped again. Let me. Let me. Um, Go for it. Yeah, sir. We, we have a little bit of extra time in between this and the afternoon breakout. And so okay. if, you, if you did sort of feel like you moved to get over the better internet, I think that everybody on here will understand that. Give me two minutes. I'm going to stop my video and audio. Give me two minutes. Sure. I can put my face up there just so folks don't get too bored. <laughs> um, but Sarah is just going to kind of, and Rob can join me too. Perfect. Sarah's just going to relocate so that she can get a little bit more constant audio. Um, I will put a pitch out there that uh, that's what it's like to live in uh, upstate New England. We uh, we run into this with a lot of our resources sometimes. Um, Sarah's out in sort of upstate Vermont, and the broadband is uh, being shared by many. <laughs> In the meantime, everyone, I'm, I'm very curious to know where you're all from. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love it if you would please just like type in what city or or, your, or even just state you're, you're here from. I'm sitting in, uh, actually, I'm, I'm in my home in New Jersey, but I work out of uh, the Philadelphia regional office, which is just about six miles away. So, um, and it's raining really heavy on my roof. So if you hear that, I do apologize. <laughs> so I'm, I'm back on, is this any better? Sounds a lot better. Okay, now I really won't move. Thank you so much for that. Just um, you know, let me know if there's issues still. Awesome. Okay, Thanks. so patient perspective, um, we had some positive feedback, some just general didn't even know I could do this feedback. 
And then March of 2020, like everybody else, we were faced with needing to expand, needing to change the way that we practiced. Um, so essentially, we were um, given a task to roll out video visit programs to all of our ambulatory teams throughout our network in two weeks. So that was over 90 sites. Um, and we knew that we needed to respond in a way that would not only serve that purpose, but would actually better prepare us for f any future programs and future state. So this, this is the picture of the wall that um, uh, my colleague I had kind of posted and the things that people on our team are like heroes because we had a lot of collaboration really quickly. Uh, this was something that our leadership was very excited about and invested in and so they decided to give us a ton of resources that we didn't have before which helped us break down some barriers. And so this is our sticky note um, wall at our office of those who helped support us and there's a lot more than this. So these are some of the barriers that we faced at the time that we were rolling out. So kind of technical barriers that we were facing at the time of us rolling out um, because we had to be resilient and make some changes in how we were practicing and implementing these programs to begin with. So um, timeline, you know, before this, it, a program might take us six to eight weeks to roll out, but this was a very short timeline. Um, it was a network priority and we had to get it done. We were given additional project managers. Um, so we had, I think, six total on our team. And then we had what we called project manager assistants, PMAs. Uh, we had 10 and who was help uh, account creations, scheduling uh, privileges, getting all of our teams prepared to be able to um, access the correct Zoom functionality. We also had a help desk created, a Zoom help desk. So we have you know, an IS service center where people call with issues, but we had an extension and a team staffing that from our team um, to support any calls or tickets coming in. We had four on that. We also changed the way that we um, scheduled the Zoom visits. Um, previously, we had shared email accounts in Outlook and that, was a kind of a longer process because we needed support and having all of that created. And so what we did is started giving everybody their own Zoom account, which eliminated that need and that support. And we were able to have our users log in using single sign-on, which made it even easier. We used to have Zoom plugins in Outlook. We changed that to the add-in, which again, eliminated a need for support and gave our users a little empowerment because they could do that themselves. We also, in the Zoom meeting invitation, we put in a lot of language specific to the health network in terms of any facing materials we wanted to provide. We also provided the consent form so that they take a look prior to the appointment um, because again, our volume was increasing so much, we needed to give patients as much beforehand as we could. We also partnered with our patient access and service center for patient preparation. So they helped support all of our sites with doing um, reminder calls and they would actually do a test Zoom visit if they were, if the patient was interested in that. And we had some really positive feedback and we're still doing that today. Um, we obviously found that we didn't have enough devices. So we needed to order a lot. We needed a better and more formal process of how to not only keep an inventory, but how to request them and approve them in general. We, we have um, Stratus devices, which are iPads for interpreter services. And we ended up pushing Zoom to all of the iPads, our MDM iPads, so we could have a little more functionality and flexibility with those. And then the other thing was training. So. Again, we have users in Vermont, we have users in New York, and we needed to reach about a thousand new users. So we 
partnered with our medical group education and training team and offered some remote sessions. And that was really successful. So again, in February, we were doing about 25 a day. We had 150 Zoom users. And as of last week, we were doing about 1500 meetings every day or visits every day. And we have about 3300 Zoom users at this point. And then going back to the previous barriers, so we had to sell telehealth, there was the lack of understanding of why, the lack of interest. We definitely broke down some of these because we had to. Um, and we broke down some because we made changes to our workflow and our engagement strategy. Uh, so lack of interest, I mean, we, we had to do it. So everybody was willing and um, the guidelines and appropriateness, we, have a we had a lot of um, feedback from providers on well geez I didn't know I could do this or I'm really surprised that that went well and I could look at a hand really closely or something like that so previously we were only doing visits with established patients but of course now we needed to start seeing new patients as well and so it just lent to that well that providers realized what they really could do. And again, I spoke to the scheduling process, the Zoom accounts and the add-in, um, patients not asking for it. I think they are more now, especially ones who are more comfortable with it. Um, and again, they're willing to try, especially the ones who had a positive experience and know what to expect. Um, and then broadband and cellular data are still an issue, but something that we're working on with our state. And over the last couple of months, we've been engaged with our innovation team still. Uh, the, the work is a little different because we're trying to um, take all of this into account as we move forward and keep it on a larger scale. So we did get a lot more feedback. So this, the perspectives on the next few slides are from the last couple of months. Um, so from a provider perspective, they really liked that they could see patients at home um, in their own environment, interacting with their families, if their families were there. Um, again, they were surprised with what they could do. They still, they still feel that clear guidelines would be really helpful. So that's something that we're um, working on and partnering with them on. They acknowledge that there really is a, a positive benefit um, and impact on access. Um, technical issues are still something that we need to work through with them. Um, and a lot of providers who weren't doing video visits before now really want to incorporate video visits into their everyday um, schedules. So in person and video. They have really appreciated, and patients feel this way too, the connections that they've been able to maintain over the last few months. Um, and then they each want their own device, <laughs> which will help with some efficiencies and we're working on that right now too. The staff perspective, um, technical support, they feel like they could use a little more technical support. They've heard some positive patient feedback. They've noticed or maybe acknowledged that video visits can be a good tool for triage. So it might not be appropriate see their provider, but it might be a really nice way to see a foot or hear a cough or something face to face without them coming in and then being able to assess the best way to proceed. And we're, we're hearing a lot of, they really want to better understand the patient experience so we can make it even better. Patient perspective, we've heard a mix. Um, video visit went really well. Um, again, they've appreciated the opportunity to stay in touch. Um, a couple quotes in here that we really liked. I hope when the pandemic is over, UVM will continue to offer telemedicine visits, which we don't know if that means they weren't, <laughs> this patient wasn't aware that we did them before, um, or they're just excited that in the future they can keep, keep going. Um, and then some feedback on the instructions were helpful, which is great because we spent a lot of time um, making that patient friendly and we worked with marketing and our training team. Um, and then 
just about positioning the camera, um, especially if their provider needs to see something in particular. And I think this speaks more to, again, or back to the education and uh, preparing patients in the right way. So now our work is around um, strategies around devices. So um, we have virtualized environments that we're working on changing so that we can have Zoom supported on more devices throughout the network. Uh, in the next couple of months, we should see some major progress with that. Feedback from a team that we're piloting an integrated workflow, um, Epic and Zoom with really want their own iPads. Um, so we're deploying, actually today we're deploying those and getting some feedback next week on how that's working better. So creating those efficiencies and making some improvements. Um, we've engaged with our teams on reopening and future planning. So that's more work that we are working with our innovation team on in addition to leadership and uh, providers and staff and people in different roles. Education is something that we need to keep going, whether that be remote sessions or just different materials that we're providing. Um, guidelines around appropriateness, and that's something that as we work more with the reopening and future planning, we'll get, we'll, that will certainly be incorporated into that. And so we are, um, we use Epic and we recently rolled out um, a pilot program with Epic Epic's MyChart televideo visit. So it's integrated um, and we piloted, we started piloting that a few weeks ago at one of our family medicine sites. We continuously get feedback um, and troubleshoot every day and we are working to improve that and eventually roll that out through our network. And then, as I mentioned before, the broadband and um, cellular data, but we're working with the state of Vermont on that and that's being supported um, at a higher level too. And that's, those are my slides. So thank you very much. Well, terrific. So it looks like we have um, almost half an hour of uh, time for, for questions and um, conversations. So um, everyone, please uh, do go ahead and uh, raise your hand if you'd like to say something, uh, comment or ask a question or Sarah's story, interact with Sarah in some kind of way. <laughs> um, also, um, alternatively, go ahead and type your, your question or comment into the, the app and uh, we will read it out loud. Okay, it looks like Helen wants to, Helen. Okay, Helen, you should be audible. All right, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Sarah, how are you? <laughs> Hi, Helen, how are you? Good. Hey, could you talk a little bit, and I apologize if this was something um, lost in the, in the audio issues. I know that we've been discussing right. a lot in Vermont, and probably other people are having this same issue. So it, I, I would love to talk a little bit more about how we do that estimate of the amount of support that providers need to stand mm -hmm. up a telemedicine program. Um, for, I, I represent the federally qualified health centers in Vermont, along with um, Planned Parenthood clinics and free clinics. And one thing that we have been talking to UVM about is, like, if we want to take on the task of educating providers on the basics of telemedicine provision and maybe some of the basics of, you know, e-consults, remote patient monitoring, some of those um, telehealth things, just how heavy of a lift is that? You did mention the three trainings a day for the course of two weeks. Do you have any good ways to, to think about how, how much of a resource and time and money it is to build up those support systems based on how many providers you have to reach? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, so with respect to the remote sessions, I maybe should have clarified. So what our training team did is they did, um, role-based sessions daily. So there were, I think they had two provider, two scheduler, and two roomer sessions based on the workflow, and they offered them every day so that teams could join whenever they could. So they could schedule it on their own. They also recorded them, and we've provided them with the link. Um, in terms of standing up, I think it goes back to identifying 
the why and the appropriate patience and then putting that process into place and identifying um, who will do the scheduling, how it should be done. Now we use Zoom and we love it, um, but I'm aware that other teams and facilities don't use Zoom. So it's really um, deciding what works best and then putting a workflow into place. And I strongly advise that when you're working on a workflow, you have every everybody who's touching that engaged. So even pulling in a patient and definitely the provider, the scheduler, um, billing, compliance, pulling in all of those resources to make sure that you're meeting all of those requirements. And your team, I'm not sure if I'm still on mute or not, your team is quite impressively small, I guess is a way to say it, in terms of how many people you've, you've been able to reach. It's what yeah. gives me hope every day that we'll be able to do it for the <laughs> FQHCs. <laughs> Absolutely, I have no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> so Sarah, it looks like, thank you so much, Helen, that's awesome. And I'm going to mute you now, but please raise your hand again if you'd like to uh, chime back in. Um, anyone else, please go ahead and raise your hand. And in the meantime, we have some written questions. Uh, Sarah says, I, I may have missed, are you using the telehealth for non-physician providers, particularly post, sorry, post COVID? Um, we, so we're an academic medical center um, and we have um, residents and we have medical students and we have processes where we have residents or medical students seeing the patient via Zoom and then regrouping with the attending on the side and then going back together to the patient to present next steps and recommendations and things like that. So um, yeah, we and we have APPs, we have any, anybody, essentially any provider who is providing services to patients was given a Zoom account when we rolled this out at the end of March. Great. We have a lot of questions popping in. That's great. And I think I may have been going out of order. Sorry about that, folks. So I think the first that popped in is, uh, would you describe your program's growth as linear or have you, uh, or have new opportunities for telehealth utilization shown up organically as well? Yeah, that I like. I like that. Um, well, and I think we're in a different world right now than we were in four months ago. As I spoke to, and I'm sorry if you missed it, before the COVID, we keep calling it this rapid response or rapid implementation. We really had to go out and um, advertise what we could do and try to um, get people excited and engaged. And now it's just part of it's not necessarily a different, it's not a project, it's incorporated into the process now. It's incorporated into the clinic, so it's different. So I would say more organically now. I mean, it's just, and more people are asking pharmacists are starting to do this. And so I would say it used to be kind of linear and now it's just all over popping up. Well, that helps keep it fun, doesn't it? <laughs> it sure does. It sure does. <laughs> so uh, next question, are you thinking of incorporating remote patient monitoring as part of your telehealth strategy beyond video visits? Yeah, so we have a remote patient monitoring program with our home health and hospice team. Um, in terms of, I don't know if this is more in terms of like primary care or family medicine or cardiology or things like that. Um, I don't know specifically, we've, we've heard feedback from both patients and providers about using peripherals um, and how they're not necessarily comfortable doing that. And I think that eventually our primary care providers would likely be interested in more of that so they can collect the data points um, and then have a video visit as a follow-up or some type of combination. So I don't really have an answer to that, but it's something that is on our radar. Can you talk about how your system is adapting the normal workflows for the next stage of COVID preparation, for example, or in other 
afterwards, a mixture of in-person and virtual. Yeah. Um, so there's a higher level strategy um, of leadership really wants to see a specific mix of in-person and video. And we're still doing some telephone in there as well. It's That volume has gone down quite a bit. Um, and part of this is that we want we want video visits to stay. Um, and part of that is we know that we can only have a certain percentage of our capacity in the clinic at a time. So all of that coming together um, and in, in conjunction with the feedback from providers of how they do wanna mix these, we also still have some providers working from home. So they're, they're doing a lot of virtual visits. We have some providers who are doing video visits you know, all day, two or three days a week from home and not going into the clinic at all. So this um, mixture of in-person and virtual is really a higher level leadership strategy that I'm not necessarily pulled into, but this is some of the work that we're doing again with our innovation team Thank you, Sarah. Um, we have more coming in for you. So uh, going forward, what will or what support will be provided for patients? I noticed you indicated that, uh, quote, not always sure how to position the camera, especially if the provider needs to see something in particular. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I, I think it's a partnership between the patient and their provider um, ahead of time, uh, giving them the materials that they need, etiquette, or just doing a practice. So our patient access and service center reaches out to patients and in Epic, we had a flag built where we can see on the schedule um, quickly whether or not the patient, patient feels prepared for the visit. And if they're not, they're always getting a call and they're always being offered the opportunity to connect via a test Zoom visit. So we're trying to build these types of processes and, and education points into all of this, all of the appointments, so that patients have what they need ahead of time. Sounds good. Next question, if you were in a practice, not at an academic medical institution, what would you recommend as a good resource in workflow? I'm not sure I understand the question. Would you recommend as a good resource? So if somebody, if anyone who asked that question or has an idea about it um, would like to raise their hand and, and explain a little bit clear, more clearly, we can uh, address it verbally. I don't know that I'm 100% clear on it either, but my first inclination is to say the telehealth resource center. That's the resource, <laughs> the first go-to resource. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So um, uh, moving on until we hear more about that, I'm curious about how this training education will be provided. Uh, quote, education, all roles. I guess this is probably referencing something you said about educating. Uh, providers or patients? Yep. So in our workflow, we have the um, scheduler scheduling the Zoom. So they schedule in Epic, they schedule in Zoom. Um, then we have someone who's doing the quote unquote rooming, even though it's virtual, we have um, a, an MA or an LPN or someone getting into the Zoom visit, welcoming the patients, going through pain scale, chief complaint, all of the regulatory requirements, and then they're jumping out and the providers jumping into that Zoom meeting. And so we're, we've identified kind of three main roles, the scheduler, the rumor, and the provider. And our education team put together um, Skype recorded sessions that walk the user through each one of those roles. So that's that's what I meant by role specific. We have a ton of documentation that's shared. We use Teams, so it's posted in Teams. We also use SharePoint, so it's posted in SharePoint um, on a network site for our health network. And we have an internal one uh, just for our medical group, it's all the same material. So that was something else that we needed to do is since we changed the process, um, 
we also needed to update all of our materials. And so we partnered with training on that. I did a bunch, my team did a bunch and um, all of the clinics have access. They had some hard copies, they have it, you know, um, electronically and they have access to all of those links as well. So it was a combination. It was um, documents and um, actual recording, recorded sessions. And Sarah, we have a, a comment from Helen in the Zoom webinar chat. Um, and it's saying you have a webinar on it posted, it being, I think, uh, workflow to the, uh, or to the early question, Sarah did a really good webinar on workflow development for practices with Northeast Telehealth Resource Center in Vermont. It's in the workflows section of this toolkit and she's providing the link for the toolkit, which is, looks like televermont.com atavist.com slash telehealth hyphen in hyphen Vermont. Thank you. And so while we're still waiting for, uh, and folks, uh, while the Zoom webinar chat is here, we're asking that you please use the app uh, to submit your written questions because that also provides the, um, the record for the, um, the telehealth session. Uh, Great, so we have another question here. Could you give some detail slash examples of types of clinical guidelines you recommend or you mentioned that providers would like? Yeah, um, I think that going back to barriers months ago, and it, it still is um, to some extent, providers just aren't sure what's appropriate um, for a video visit versus coming in. And I think they've learned a lot because they had to, but they still want to know um, if you need to touch the patient, the patient likely needs to come in, right? But there are other things that could go either way. And I referenced like looking at a hand and, and one piece of feedback that we got was, for um, orthopedics, they, they thought that patients needed to come in because they need to palpate, they need to view, they need to touch, but you can direct patients to do that on video. So things like that, and, I, and it might be specialty specific where they wanna get into appropriateness, um, but overall we're hearing a sense from staff too of we want really clear guidelines on what patients have to come in for versus what we could do over video. Judy, did that answer your question? Yes, okay. Excellent. <laughs> you know where to find me if it didn't. <laughs> well, this is a fun question, uh, Sarah. Uh, favorite story of a patient engagement or patient feedback factoring into your planning? <laughs> Ooh. You can take um, that anywhere you like, it sounds. <laughs> you know what I actually really liked? Um, a patient made a comment that getting bad news at home is a lot more comfortable. Mm. And I think that we need to be cognizant of that. Um, getting lab results or getting test results, I mean, Patients have also commented on, you know, I could see the provider's pictures on their wall and that was kind of like weird and was that crossing a line and I don't know and they can see my walls and things like that. So there's etiquette we can certainly um, help everybody with, but I, it kind of hit home when the patient said that they got bad news and it was much better for them to be at home to get that because it was a place of comfort. So I think we need to keep that in mind as we move forward. And has that changed any, the way that you deliver quote bad news um, in any way yet? You know, I think that was a hematology feedback specific, and I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So folks, we have up to another 20 minutes for discussion. So uh, please go ahead and raise your virtual hands or continue to type in some questions in the app. And meanwhile, Sarah, uh, this one question here about uh, being in an academic medical center sort of got me wondering um, mm -hmm. what types of supports 
are you aware of that were available to you because you were in an academic medical center that might not be there if you're in a private practice? Do you have an idea about that or any thoughts? Um, not really, because I've always been in an academic medical center. Um, I think it certainly complicates the workflow a little bit because you're pulling in additional providers and you need to make sure that the resident or medical student is um, practicing and getting what they need, but you also need to make sure that the patient's needs are met. And I think that virtually was tricky in the beginning, but we did figure out a process where um, we could use a separate Zoom for the um, medical student or resident to review with the provider and then go back to the patient together. So it's just a matter of working that out. I don't mean to hone on that too much, but sort of what I'm wondering is like um, sometimes, sometimes because you're, if you're a larger institution, there are certain things already present, like there's space that you can use or there's technology that already exists within the university or academic system where there's, um, you know, there are other people that, um, you know, you're not already paying for, but you're sort of connected to already. So it's kind of thinking about those things. Yeah, not that I, not that I know of, sorry. Okay. No, we have a question from Sheila. Sheila, I'm going to unmute you and you should now be able to speak. Sheila, if you're speaking, you should, Sheila, can't see the whole name, R-Y. Uh, you've been unmuted and if you're speaking, maybe your computer is muted. Okay, something's not working there. So we will uh, move on to the next question, which is, uh, can you tell us, Sarah, a bit about your interpreter services and the experience of adding that to the system's video visits? Sure, so we have Stratus iPads um, deployed at all of our sites and we have Zoom on them now too. And so when we have a need for an interpreter, um, well, it can be done um, one of two ways. So sometimes the Zoom invitation is being sent to the interpreter if we know of that service being needed ahead of time and we know who will be partaking in that um, so they can join the Zoom session as well. And then the other piece is that we can use on the device we can in the moment select what service you need or what language you need and pull that third party into the visit. Looks like uh, Ms. Sheila Ryan, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, oh, something's not working. Okay, there we go. You should be unmuted, Sheila. Okay, for some reason we're not hearing Sheila, but it looks like in the uh, Zoom chat, she has typed in the question, how is the state helping with broadband and cell issue? Yeah, so they, uh, the state of Vermont acknowledges that there's, there are areas that just don't have cell, cellular coverage or broadband um, capabilities. And so the state is investing quite a bit of uh, financial support to do another assessment and then build up in the areas that just are disparate, that don't have it. Um, so, and then um, we're trying to partner with the state on what that could and should look like. So I, there's an opportunity there, which is very exciting. <laughs> Obviously I need <laughs> some help too. And I live in Chittenden County right outside of Burlington. And um, so, so there we go. <laughs> Sarah, does your system have any school-based televisits uh, work going on or in the plans? I love that um, because right before um, COVID, I was working with a uh, pediatrician in one of our um, 
Peds offices here and we were starting to engage with a school nurse um, in a really small city here right outside of Burlington um, about for a school based program. So I had started working with him on the workflow and engaging with this school nurse to see if we could test it out there. So the answer is no, we don't. But um, it's been something passionate for me to start working on for the last, I don't know, six or so months. So I'm hoping we can in the fall, hopefully kind of re regroup on that. Great question. Thank you. That sounds like a great opportunity too. That's terrific. Yeah. So while we're waiting for the next questions, and folks, we still have another 15-ish minutes. So if you'd like to raise your hand and uh, be heard, uh, please do that. If you'd like to contribute uh, something in writing, please do that through the app. Um, and meanwhile, Sarah, if somebody, uh, I wonder if you have any um, thoughts about like, what are the first you know, one, two, or three things that somebody would might do if they wanted to replicate what you've described? Um, for implementing in general? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, one, two, three things. Um, or maybe just one. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, I think the why behind this is really, really important. So what are we trying to do and why? Identifying the why will help lay out all of the work that needs to be done um, and I, I really, I said this, but I really strongly recommend engaging with patients when you're working through the process. We did that to a certain extent, but I think not enough. Um, and as we're moving forward, we are now, but we get patient feedback constantly. And it's just, it's so important and helpful. So I would strongly, strongly recommend that as well. Well, that sounds like great advice. Thank you. Uh, okay, question. We have a uh, question that's been upvoted, Sarah. Do you have provider to provider telehealth connections set up? We do. Yep. Um, yeah, we do. We have, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, it's, it's mostly patient to provider, but we do, we do have a couple small pilots where we have providers connecting via Zoom to review imaging or um, just history and need recommendations and things like that. Sarah, do you have high patient utilization of patient portal uh, is is that an area you work on yeah that's a good, that's a great question too so we like i said we're an epic user and my chart um is what we call our patient portal some of our sites have i don't know a 50 percent activation rate and some have like 10 or 15 so because we're moving, well, one, there's been a marketing push anyway to increase activations, but because we're moving toward an integration between Epic and Zoom using MyChart televideo visits, which patients will access through MyChart, we need higher activations. So we are working with our marketing and training teams and patient access center to encourage patients to activate more. Um, so it's not... I'm not on the MyChart team, but I speak with them every day. Um, and we are trying to figure out how to increase activations and get patients more engaged with that. And Sarah, are you using other e-health capabilities to augment the telehealth visit? Yeah, so we have e-visits um, implemented within our, um, within the medical center, primary care and uh, family medicine for patients 18 plus. And an e-visit, for those of you who don't know, is an asynchronous encounter between a patient and a provider. So they log into my chart and they complete a symptoms-based questionnaire and it goes to an in-basket in Epic, the provider grabs it reviews it, 
sends a response with um, recommendations, maybe a prescription depend prescription depending on um, follow up needs, and it's all done asynchronously and through Epic functionality. So we have e-visits. We've been live at one site here for two years and we just rolled out um, a few more sites over the last couple of weeks and we're expanding through our network next Wednesday, actually. Um, we're, we have a very small e-consults program, which is dermatology in one of our family medicine sites and eventually we'll get back to that work. Um, we kind of paused expansion of that over the last few months, but we will be expanding e-consults as well. Well, what a timely question that was for you. Yeah, that was <laughs> really great. Thank you. So uh, does your system plan the rollout of workflows or telehealth methods to your various locations homogeneously, or do you plan for variation within each site? For example, EHR utilization. Yeah, that's, that's really great too. We, we pretty strongly believe in being as standard and consistent as we can be. Um, it's great for our patients. It's great for our staff and our providers. Um, sometimes you can't, so you have to make, you have to create workflows that really meet the needs of the providers. If there's additional, you know, testing or imaging that needs to be integrated, but generally our, our, processes, our workflows, and our rollout plans are very, very similar from one to the other. And outside of COVID-19, have you been collecting data on impact of telehealth on total cost of care? Uh, is there any insight from the earlier pilots? Yeah, I don't know that we've collected data on cost of care per se, but we do look at billing reports every month to see what types of payments we're getting. Um, and we continue to do that. And, you know, as things have changed a lot over the last few months, it's a little, it's um, better <laughs> and different. But before that, yeah, we, we would um, regularly look at payments and if something looked odd or we didn't we weren't paid for something someone from my team would look into that with our billing team and try to understand why and how to avoid any issues in the future okay as of this moment we have no further questions and uh, folks we do have up to another seven minutes if you'd like to uh, engage with sarah vocally again please raise your hand virtually uh, or go ahead and type in a question or even a comment in the um, in the app. Sarah, I wonder, so while we're waiting for that and uh, been a lot of interaction. You're getting some thank yous already, Sarah. Um, You're welcome. Uh, I wonder if, if you were potentially anticipating any questions that <laughs> haven't surfaced. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> no, I got a lot. These were really great questions. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate that because, you know, my, my slides were a lot of just feedback. Um, so I really appreciate the engagement in the questions. Sarah and Rob, I have one more, and it's more just because I know that uh, Sarah touched on it briefly, and I think it's a cool thing that hopefully folks are doing, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about. Um, Sarah, you mentioned how important it is to kind of make sure you have the right people in the room when you're planning this stuff out, like in terms of the provider that's actually going to use the technology and so on and so forth. Do you include providers in the demo testing of technology when you purchase it? Um, and what's that process been like? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, we always, always is a strong word, but we generally have a, a provider champion. So they're typically, and this is kind of past, well, I guess it's now too. Um, we always have a provider who's championing this and pushing it. And so they are involved in the whole process, workflow, um, documentation, testing, training. They're involved in every step along the way to make sure that it's meeting the needs and achieving the why to, you know, 
what we're doing. Um, so if we were to test different technologies and we would certainly include them in that. How about, um, to, uh, piggybacking on that question, how about the degree to which patients are included in that, Sarah? Are they also sort of part of the, I don't know, thinking or, or data gathering around when you're experimenting like that? Yeah, so I would say that up until this point, my perspective on that is that we haven't done that enough but we are starting to as we're moving forward. And as one of the slides, I had a list of things that we're strategizing around and patients will be pulled into most of those pieces. It's really important. So here's another question for you, Sarah. Uh, do telehealth vendors take feedback from you on product improvement uh, is there a place for users, providers, or patients to be part of that? We um, absolutely give feedback to our vendors regularly. <laughs> um, and yeah, we, we get feedback from providers and patients and staff members, and we take all of the feedback and we want to make it better and we bring it back to the vendor. So we, the patient or provider might not speak with the vendor, but we certainly can be an intermediary to take that back. And there are certain things that have to be improved and we push, we push hard on those. Can you think of one, one, one specific example of something that a vendor has actually um, received feedback about and then acted on and fixed or changed for you? Sure. Well, what in, in, so we have a, um, a telestroke program where we have when we use a platform called a vendor called American Well um, and so we have a patient in one of our partner emergency rooms that has um, stroke symptoms and if they fall into a certain criteria then a process is initiated with our stroke neurologists and they connect via video and they share imaging and there we've learned so we've been live with that for over a year now but we've learned a lot along the way and so we regularly meet with American Well and give them feedback and we we push them. We have a list of improvements and enhancement requests, and we follow up on that regularly. So that's what com that that's what came to mind when I read that question. Terrific. Okay, we are nearing the end of our time. We have just a couple minutes left. Uh, and Sarah, if you're not seeing it, note that we have a. a, a Quite a few thank yous and people saying they've enjoyed the session and new people would just from reading your bio. <laughs> uh, um, so as we're winding down folks, um, I want you to know that I was looking to see where you're all from and I, when I asked you to type in your state, I saw Maryland, I saw Vermont, I saw uh, Kentucky, let's see, I saw, uh, did I say Maryland? Uh, I think I saw Pennsylvania. So um, thank you for that. I was paying attention. Uh, okay, please remember uh, that um, uh, the uh, Telehealth Resource Centers really would appreciate your feedback on this session. I, I know they'll use it to inform future programs. So please uh, don't forget to provide your session feedback in the app. Um, I want to thank you all again for being here. And uh, if you're on the East Coast, or maybe even in the central of the country where I am and you haven't yet had lunch, <laughs> I hope you can go get some before you jump into whatever you're doing next. Um, I think that pretty much brings us to the end of the session. So th thank you, Reed and Jason, for your technical support. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for joining and bearing with me. I appreciate it. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks.